Let's open our Bibles to Revelation 3. Revelation chapter 3, we're going to begin in verse 14, the letter to the church at Laodicea. Good to see you all here tonight. Always good to be together. So we're going to finish tonight the, um, the letters to the seven churches. And when we finish Laodicea, we'll kind of circle back and think about some of the things that we've learned in the letters to all of the churches. This is a very important letter, as they all are uh, very relevant to us today. So Jesus begins in verse 14, To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this. How does Jesus describe himself? He says, I am the Amen. And we talked a little bit about this last time, but what do you make of that? That Jesus calls himself the Amen. Okay, he's the beginning and the end. But what is the Amen? Truth. Yeah, I think that's the idea. What does Amen mean again? So be it, let it be. Okay, truly, truly is Amen, Amen, I say to you. And so can we count on what Jesus says? We can trust it. <laughs> and he calls himself the faithful and true witness. Again, what Jesus witnesses to, testifies to, what he says about the church at Laodicea, what he says about all of his churches. It can be trusted. It should be trusted. He's the faithful and true witness. And he's the beginning of the creation of God. And of course, that doesn't mean that Jesus is a created being, but he is the first cause. He's the source. He's the origin of creation. Or you could take it as he is the ruler of creation. Uh, he's in control, isn't he? He's in control. He's created all things, and so therefore he is over all things and is in control. As he writes this letter, and still today, right? Jesus is in control. You're right. He's not very happy with the church at Laodicea, and we'll see that. So what does Jesus say to them? Look at verse uh, 15. We'll call that the introduction. And then he, he jumps right into the praise of the church, right? No, not in this case. Uh, it's one of the two churches where there's really no, no praise, Sardis being the other. So they're in, uh, they're in very serious spiritual trouble. It's very serious. And one of the things that's so serious about it is they don't even know the trouble that they're in. That's, that's bad. But what does he say to them? Look at verse 15. What is his rebuke of the church? He says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. What is the condition of the church? Apathetic, that's a good word for it. They're not hot for the Lord. They probably were at one time, right? They're not cold for the Lord. What would that mean if someone is cold? How would you describe that? Dead, Dead? okay. I saw that with Sardis. Hardened. It hardened hearts. Uh That's right. Cold water is useful. Hot water is useful. And we talked a little last time that Laodicea was a town that laid in between a place that had very hot water and very cold springs. 
but lukewarm water. Have you ever been working out in the hot sun and you get, maybe you, uh, as a kid, you drank out of the hose or something and it was lukewarm? Not very refreshing, is it? Kind of disgusting. So it's the idea of usefulness. And, and it's, if they're, if, if they're right in the middle between cold and hot, it's, it's not like they're really excited about the things of the Lord. They're not really for those things. They're not pushing anymore. But they're not, they, they, they would probably say, well, yeah, I'm a follower of Christ. Uh, I'm not against the things of God. So it's riding the fence. It's in the middle. It's straddling these, these two worlds. They're, they're just in between. Greg. No spiritual healing, no spiritual refreshment, right? They're, they're, they're in the middle, not useful to the Lord. Now, why, why does Jesus say in 15, I wish that you were cold or hot? Hot, I get, right? That's easy to understand. Jesus, of course, wishes for them to be hot, or if you take it as, as the useful analogy, I, I want you to be useful one way or the other, but if, if we're talking about cold as they've, they've, they've fallen away from, from their fervor for the Lord, why would Jesus say, I, would, I wish that you were cold or hot? Patrick? Right. You've got to understand where you're at, and someone who's Who's cold? Maybe will will wake up. Wes. If you're a judge, and you know a guy is guilty, it's easier to it's easier to judge that person. If you're if you're not uh, almost guilty, maybe guilty, not so much. You don't know how to judge. Yeah, they're in the middle, right in the middle. You know, it's hard to it's hard to move a lukewarm person one direction or another. Why? Because they're they're comfortable. They're indifferent, apathetic. You know, so there's this idea everything's fine when it's when it's not fine. I always think Scott and marital counseling. If, if the relationship between a husband and they're either hot or cold. The counselor can work with that. Right. He has a place to work with. But the most dangerous part is to just be blocked. Just like, yeah. I don't care, yeah. whatever. Yeah. It's a great point. I don't care anymore. Whatever. How do you work with that? How do you move people off of that? Uh, or you may have people that are, you know, they're, they're religious people in name at least. And they think that they're right with the Lord, they're okay with the Lord, but the Lord is saying it's not, it's not good. You're not okay. But they don't see it. Greg. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Good thought. Yeah. Spencer. Please, if 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they, yeah, isn't that powerful? I, I stand at the door and knock. You just have to open the door. Let me in again. Yeah, great thought. Right? This, he's speaking to the church. These are people in Christ. And it's important to remember that. He's talking to people who are in Christ, who are saved. They're in the church. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. They're fine with themselves and they think everything's fine. So what are some um, symptoms of being lukewarm that we could notice in ourselves? Like how, how, would you, how would you know if you have this problem? I think when you, when you say to yourself things like, I know I should change. I know the Lord doesn't really approve of this, and I'll get around to that one day. That's not good. That's not good. Right. Yeah. Yeah, he wants some fervency, some action, some some passion. Yeah, Ben. Right. Right. And yet sometimes people can get there, right? Where they feel, you know, I've, I've learned everything I need to learn. I know what I need to know. This is all kind of old to me. And there's no push to keep growing and moving ahead. It's a great thought. I know I should change. I know I should do better, but I'm just not interested. Comment over here. It is. Yeah. Right. They're comfortable. They're complacent. Yeah. Yeah. They don't see an issue. Right. It's a dangerous place to be, isn't it? Linda. Right. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we can easily fall into that. Well, that, those were nice words, but it has no effect on our lives. But I, I'm happy that I came and heard it, and I feel like I did, I did my duty. And you know, you, a lukewarm person might pray, they might read their Bible, they might come to worship, but maybe it's merely, merely out of habit. Maybe it's merely out of obligation. It's kind of half-hearted. There's no. No, no real concern for spiritual things. Right. 
Charles. Oh, interesting. I'm going to watch that next time I go to a restaurant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If they spill it on you, maybe not so much. <laughs> yes. Water and cold water. Yeah. Right. One is refreshing. One is, is not. Mm. Dawn. Yes. Right. Yeah. And this letter to Laodicea, I think, is one of the most um, obviously applicable to the church in the, in the United States, uh, to this church, to all of us. Because, and we're going to get to that in a moment. It, you can, because of our wealth, get very um, complacent in our spiritual walk. And so, yeah, Wes. Yes. Very true. Great thought. What is the consequence of their lukewarmness? Look at verse 16. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. They're going to be rejected by Jesus. Uh, vomited out is the word. Spewed out. It's... It's distasteful to Jesus when we're lukewarm. It's, it's something that he will reject eventually. You know, that's, that's heavy words. I will spew you out of my mouth because you are lukewarm. And then look at verse 17. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. What is their attitude about themselves? How do they see themselves? Everything's good. I'm rich. Self-sufficient. Yeah, it's a great word. I, I'm, I've got everything I need. Terry. Oh, 
That's a great point. Some people can be rich and still miserable, and people can be rich but still very poor. And so he says, Yeah, well, they can feel satisfied, but they're really actually very poor. And we'll see that. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, they feel satisfied. They feel because of their riches. And, and Laodicea was a very rich city, known for their banking, had a lot of money. Probably the church, the members were well off physically. I, I'm rich. Right. I have become wealthy and have need of nothing. I'm self-sufficient. We had a song that we sang, I need thee every hour. Mm -hmm. So different from you. Yes. Very different. I need thee every hour. But they said, I have need of nothing. And then he says some of the most frightening words to me. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You see the danger of lukewarmness here? You don't even know. Oh, I'm rich. And Jesus says, you're not rich. You are so impoverished that you don't even have enough to wear. You're naked. You're miserable. You're an object of pity. And that is the danger here of lukewarmness. Uh, we feel good, but we're not really seeing the true spiritual reality. We're not seeing our true spiritual condition. And so they, yes, they were very rich, and, and uh, Jesus knows their true condition. They're in bad shape. And so we see then why Jesus would rather that they were cold. Maybe then they'd wake up. Maybe then they would see their condition. I wonder if you would pray this prayer to God. Lord, help me to see my true spiritual condition. I mean, I want you to show me. And that could be very uncomfortable. Possibly. But we need to know. Sherry. Yeah. Yeah, I'm good. That's right. And and th that can be a complacency that creeps in. I I check the box and I'm good. You know, Patrick. They can't be bought. And, yeah. And it's interesting, Jesus says to them, I advise you to buy from me these things. But it's not, it's not going to be from money, is it? Let's look at that. What does Jesus advise them to do? What's his instruction? Verse 18. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may become rich. What's he talking about here? Gold refined by fire from Jesus. Okay, it's pure riches. It's true riches. Yeah, treasure in the spiritual sense, right? You need to come to me for the true rich riches, Jesus says. Yeah, go ahead, Spencer. 
Right. Yeah, it's not going to get burned up. That's right. It's lasting, eternal treasure so that you may become rich. You, remember, you're, you're miserable and naked and poor, but you could become rich if you would come to me again and have the true riches. Uh, he, what else does he advise them? To buy white garments so that you may clothe yourself. They've got to come to Jesus for that. Now, what does the white garments symbolize, do you think? Purity, righteousness. You need to come to me for holiness and purity and righteousness. And only Jesus can provide that. But they're going to have to wake up and come to him and, and buy it from him. What else does he advise them? And by the way, they, Laodicea was famous for their black sheep, their black wool. Very world famous for that. But he says, you, I think he's using this aspect of the city. You need white garments from me. You need to come to me for purity. Um, what else does he advise? You need eye salve to anoint your eyes. And Laodicea was very famous for their eye salve. Um, but he says, you need, you need to come to me so that you can truly see again. You need to let me anoint your eyes to see the truth, to see your condition, to see the light again, so that you may see. And he says in verse 19, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Might there be a problem if, if someone is living in continual willful sin and yet they're not receiving any discipline from God? What, what might that indicate? Well, God disciplines every son he receives. As a good father, we saw that in Hebrews 12, he, he disciplines his children and I would be worried. You're illegitimate if you're not receiving discipline. That's right. And so Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm going to bring reproof and discipline because I love you. I want you to turn this around. And it's amazing to me, um, you know, looking back at, at 17, uh, 18 rather, these are the things you need to buy from me and, and Jesus is saying, I will give them to you. I'll give them to you freely, but you have to come to me. And, and that's something I think we need to do continually, is to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I need your riches. I want your riches. Lord, I need your righteousness. Uh, I, I, I need you to open my eyes, Lord, so that I can see. Help me to see what I really am. That's an important prayer. Dennis. Yeah. I think that's that's right, you know, and it may cost them to to shake them out of their complacency. They they may need to leave some things behind in this life. It's a great thought. Without money, without price. Yeah. Good. Chet. Yeah. And only Jesus can give it, and they've got to come to him. There's got to be that understanding. Terry. Yeah. Yeah, you've got to buy it for your for yourself. You, you've got to you've got to do it. Yeah, yeah. Good thought. Go right ahead. Yeah. 
certain, mm. where they, they, the faithful spies that tended their, their lamps with oil and were preparing to leave the room. Right. Um, the ones that didn't maintain the oil for their lamps decided to purchase, decided to get the oil from the ones that did preserve their lamps. And then the ones that were faithful told them you might have to go to like the city and someone that sells the oil. Right. So, so by the time they get there to the wedding banquet, the, the other five aren't let in. Right. It's too late. Anyway, so just. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting thought. And he says, um, let's look at verse 19 again. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. You need to have some fire about you. And you need to repent and you need to do it quickly. Uh, that, that says that they could repent. They, they could wake up. They could come out of this lukewarmness. Uh, and they need to do it quickly because Jesus is coming to discipline them. Yeah, come out of your stupor. Yeah. Verse 20. I love this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. How patient of Jesus. Remember, these are people who who have been saved. They're, they're in Christ. They're, they're the church. And yet Jesus is standing outside because of their lukewarmness. And Jesus, though He could demand entry into our lives, He doesn't do that, does He? He stands at the door and He knocks. And what does Jesus want? He wants to come in. He wants to come into our hearts. He wants to come into their heart again. But he's just standing and knocking. I, I've always pictured like a house with the party going on inside and nobody's paying attention and Jesus is knocking. Will anyone hear my voice? I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. It's a picture of fellowship, relationship with Jesus. I will come in and have a meal with you. I will sit at the table with you. There will be these warm feelings of joy and, and, and fellowship with Jesus himself. But you've got to open the door. Make the decision. Come out of your stupor. Go to the door and open the door. And, you know, again, he's talking to his church. And sometimes when a person gets so complacent and self-sufficient and maybe just holding to a semblance of religion, they're not experiencing the fullness of what Jesus is offering. That is relationship, fellowship with Him. And you have to open, open the door. And I, I believe it would be very good for each of us to invite Jesus into our hearts. I'm talking about to us, the church. We've already been saved. We're in Christ. But don't let Jesus stand on the outside. Invite Him in to your life. Invite Him into your heart. I think we should do it often. Uh, I was talking to Bob earlier about this, and he, he mentioned the psalm about, uh, Lord, search my heart. Know my anxious thoughts. Isn't that an invitation for Him to come in to the heart? Or I think about uh, John 14, where Jesus says, If anyone loves me, and, and he will keep my commandments, and my Father and I will come and make, my, make our abode with Him. I mean, Jesus wants to come into the heart. But we have to let Him in. And if we're, we're missing so much if we don't do that. Did you have a thought, Mike? Yes. That's right. Let Him in again. And He'll be happy to come in again. 
but you've got to let him let him do that. Dennis. Right. Yes, intentional. That's a good word. Be intentional about our walk. Dennis? Yes, that's very good. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's true. Mm. That's true. Yeah, very true. Charles. Caleb. Mm. Very good thought. Yeah, how do you come out of this, right? But if you just have a little ember of faith, you know, start using it. Start applying your faith. He, he was saying just one prayer. You know, just start moving in the right direction. It's a really a great thought. Charles? I don't know. I know the picture you're talking about, though. Mm. Oh, I never noticed that. I'll do that, yeah. Yeah, uh, he's talking about the picture you've probably seen of Jesus standing outside the door knocking. He said there's no doorknob on the outside in the picture. So you've got to let him in. Wes? Yeah. Yes. Right. We have help from him, don't we? Yeah. Very good. Uh, let's finish it up and then we'll do chapter four and maybe get into five next week. But look at the end of chapter 3. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. As I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Think about that. Sitting with Jesus on his throne. And he's reigning now, isn't he? That's going to become important as we get into Revelation, the rest of it. Jesus is reigning. He is sitting on his throne and we can join him there, just as he joined his father on the throne. Verse 22, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And we really need to hear this one in our culture, with our riches, with our American ideal of self-sufficiency and all of that, which is not necessarily a bad thing until you take it into the spiritual realm. And uh, we just need to be careful. We need to be careful, and we need to be inviting Jesus into our hearts. Patrick, final word. Yes. Right. Yeah. Now I'm good. I'll live however I want. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. 
So yes. If you your mind, right. You be zealous. Move forward. You know, don't be comfortable. Let's not be comfortable in our walk. Well, let's end, end together in prayer tonight. Would you bow with me? Father, this was uh, such an important lesson, and we're so thankful to have been able to sit at your feet and to hear your word. We pray that we would take it to heart. We pray that we would examine our own lives. And Father, we do ask you to help us to see our true spiritual condition and help us to make the changes that we need to make. Help us always to be inviting your Son into our heart to help us. And, and Father, we, we responded to his invitation to become your children, and, and now we want to invite your Son always and again to, to live within us and reign within us and to, to make his abode with us. Lord, we pray for uh, all of those among us who are grieving and those who are facing illness and struggles in this life. We pray that you would be with each one. And we pray that you would go with us in the uh, rest of this week ahead. Help us, Lord, to hold fast to you no matter what happens. Thank you for your love, and we thank you most of all for your son, Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.